a quick introduction, um, and we'll leave as much time for questions as we possibly can. Um, feel free to populate the chat with questions, and I'll have a look while Gary Parker is talking and presenting this evening. Um, welcome to everybody. Um, looks like everybody is really skilled at Zoom etiquette. The microphones are all off. And feel free to turn your cameras on. Nobody's going to see you except us, um, as long as you don't make any oh, Don't worry about it. If you have uh, questions, feel free to ask. At the end of the meeting, there will be a pop-up window with a few questions that will help the Subjects Association as well as the ministry who is funding these workshops through the term. Um, yeah, I think that's about it. Oh, and if Carrie doesn't already mention it, keep your eyes on the folder for secure resources from NZIP. Things keep dripping into that. Um, even just a few minutes ago, more stuff went in for the internal. So I'm sure more stuff will manifest for the external as well. So just keep, you know, glancing into those secure folders when you can. And I think the last thing, Carrie, um, any introduction that you would like or just roll with it? Um. Well, Karakoto, uh, lots of people who are on here know me already. I came from England in 2004 to New Zealand because it's a really great place. I never went back. Um, in England, I well, I've been teaching for a very long time. I think my uh, teaching license started in 1984. So that's a long time. Mm. Um, but... Whereas, uh, yeah, so I've been through teaching lots of different places and things and I've done quite a lot of teaching of heat. So I was surprised when I came to New Zealand that there wasn't any thermodynamics, kinetic theory of gases, lots of things that are in physics around the world. And but it's OK, we teach other stuff. And I, I, But yeah, it came to when we started doing this standard, I started thinking, whoa, I don't know how many teachers have ever done measurement of specific heat capacity and measurement of latent heat and stuff that I used to do a hundred years ago. So um, Dave suggested I made some videos. So um, I'll share my screen. So what I've, uh, so hopefully you'll be able to see the uh, slides that I made. So um, I believe uh, Helen's gonna make the slides up here at the end. Can you see it Dave? Yes. All yep. good. So, you, so you can see teaching energy, practical activities, Harry yep. Parker, nuclear with boys. Hi, that's where I work now. I used to work, I worked at Auckland Girls at, at Takura Correspondent School, Wellington High, Wellington College, and now I'm here. Hmm. So um, this is just a screenshot of the four videos that I made um, with for, uh, for NZIP so far. And they're in that YouTube channel, which is linked down the bottom there. Um, and, uh, if anyone's got any questions about any of those, um, I, I'm really happy to answer them now, but I didn't really think there was a lot of point in just, um, wittering on about what's in the videos and going into detail on that. You can see that the specific heat videos, nearly 20 minutes, because I do the whole thing, do the sums, do it for water, do it for oil. Uh, just using a tin can and a bit of wire and the usual, uh, just the lab pack, a voltmeter and an ammeter. Latent heat vaporization just uses um, some weighing scales and a jug kettle. And then I did actually bring along the fire stick and the hand warmer just because they're really good fun. So I'll just show you them now in case you haven't seen them. Have I gone big now? Yeah. Oh, that's been quiet. So... I won't, do, I won't actually do the fire stick thing. This is um, a fire piston fire stick, fire, I don't know. It's, oh, it's had another name when I did the risk assessment for it. But um, anyway, this is this is the gubbins that you have. And it's just really thick walled um, the specs tube, which is very airtight. And you put a little tiny bit of the cotton wadding inside. And then you just whack down you whack down the handle really, really hard. It's quite fun to, I did this afternoon. So I'm teaching 1.4 this term. I have a term to teach it. 
because we're doing three different, we're doing a chemistry, biology, and a physics standard at my school. So I'm flying the aeroplane as I build it. Anyway, this afternoon, we got a little bit of fluff in there and then got a kid come out in the front and bashed it down. He didn't bash it very hard. And you've really got to whack it. So the second time, he really whacked it. And if this is done up tight and clean, then you can get the little bit of fluff to ignite. And it's quite exciting. Um, on the video, I made sure it worked. And the uh, fire stick and... Um, yeah, there's even a slow-mo video of it happening as well. What I also brought along, because I really like these as well, is the hand warmers. Because, um, so this is a Torpedo 7 reusable hand warmer. And these, they're just so reliable and so easy to do. You just click the little clicky bit and crystals grow. So here they go. They're growing along here, and I can feel that that is already warm. So you just feel it's just nice and warm. It doesn't it doesn't get hot. Um, so as the as the liquid crystallizes, it's um, that latent heat of uh, crystallization or fusion is being given out. That's kind of cool. And these are reusable, and they what were they? Club price was at eighteen dollars for two, but um, so there's a, there's lots of little, really nice little simple things that you can do. So I made this video, um, these four videos, um, and please feel free to ask me about details either now or later when you see them. But what I've done for but oh, and I have to go in and share my screen, don't I? Sorry about this. Sharing screen two, share. And hopefully I'll start sharing again. Yep, it's there. Yeah, so that's we've seen that one. So I just went and brainstormed lots of other things that you can do to do practical work for this topic. It's very easy for it to get quite dry and just go, oh, kinetic potential, lots of equations and calculations and things. So here's some of the things that I thought of doing. And um, if you've got suggestions as well, please uh, put them in the chat and we can add them to this document. So for energy conservation, mechanical energy, which is where I've started. Uh, last Friday, we did the swinging ball of death. Um, and there's, a, there's a link there to Steve Spangler doing it, but there are loads of videos online. But there's nothing like holding a really great big heavyweight against your face on a pendulum and that you you could say do you believe in physics or do you believe in energy conservation and you let go and you know it cannot come up and hit you if you just let it go and so we had the boys doing that and they and they had to try and not flinch don't move your head and don't flinch uh on friday you definitely need supervision um but we do it with a 14 kilo, um, just a big stack of weights hanging on a on a on a rope from the a ceiling in in one of the labs. Got the kids to sit in a chair and they just volunteered to come up and show how tough they were and not flinch. But most of them do flinch. But seeing it come up to your face, so it's just that kinetic potential. The ball cannot go higher than it left. Understanding that is so important. Ah, and there's just endless experiments you can do with anything you've got lying around with boys, balls and toy cars on ramps, half pipes, curtain track. If you've got the right curtain track, you can do lots of fun stuff with curtain track, especially if it's asymmetric. There's, I put a link to a video, but you know, we shouldn't have to use the videos. Um, that video is just shows a ball bearing on a really nice low friction track where it's asymmetric and it just goes almost to the same height every time it goes backwards and forwards. But one is going to be steeper than the other, doesn't matter. Um, and the kids should be able to do a sort of predict what's going to happen thing. Much more fun if you do it live, but there's the video there. Uh, lots of springy toys are quite fun for talking about elastic potential energy. Obviously, there's sort of flicking rubber bands and catapults and things like that. But I have um, the class I've got this year, I'm not going to give them catapults. 
Um, and it's just throwing things up and dropping them, which is okay, but it's not very exciting. So what else have we got? Holding an apple. Okay, so an apple, this apple I think is about 100 grams. And the important thing about that, that is to remember that it's pushing down with the force of a Newton. And it, in the Isaac Newton was associated with the apple. So apples are really cheap at the moment. So I gave them all an apple and told them to inwardly digest my lesson. And uh, so they did. But that's it. So there's lots of things you can do with an apple and throw it around. But eating it's always good as well. Uh, and they can lift it up a metre and go, oh, I've done a drill of work. Uh, students can lift their own weight. They love running up and down staircases and measuring their power. And um, it's, I mean, I just caution getting too involved with the human body because it's a very complicated thing in terms of force and energy. Um, but just be able to measure your power output and actually see how it's not very much. You know, if you can get anything significantly over 100 watts, you're doing quite well. Um, maintaining 100 watts is difficult. If you've got equipment that does measure power output, like bicycles, uh, static bikes and things like that, it's fun to use those as well. I don't have any of those at my school. Uh, and if moving things at a steady speed, you can push a little toy car at a steady speed, but if you had something really big and beefy, it would be more fun. I downloaded some data about how hard a rugby scrum pushes today because I thought that would just be interesting to see how much work you might do pushing. Um, so um, a, a decent rugby scrum can push with a force of um, about 10,000 newtons. So, uh, you know, it's decent. Um, work of friction. So this is where I really am at the moment. You can rub your hands together, but we did do an experiment in heated sandpaper this afternoon, fresh off the block. So we have these uh, blocks which are made for pulling things along and setting in friction. But if you if you rub the sandpaper with the, with the block, this block has just got sandpaper along there. So you get certain lines where you're going to get the where you're going to end up making it hot because your work is turning into thermal energy. Um, I've still got some of these that I bought ages ago. This is thermochromic paper. And I had a quick look and uh, it's crescendo I've got some of this. So you see when I'm putting my finger on it, it's changed colour. It's really warm at the moment, so it's already pretty hot. But what I did with the boys this afternoon, we put that paper underneath the block and then they go, I mean, do you want me to do it? <laughs> um, so we were, we were backwards and forwards really hard and they were seeing how hot they could get it. And then when they picked it up, they could see on the, the paper, they could see the tracks where it had got warm and changed color. They also were able to measure the temperature using one of these. So we had, um, so this is a infrared thermometer and they could measure the temperature rise on the sandpaper where they've been rubbing it, which is quite cool. If you've got an infrared camera, some schools have got infrared cameras, and if you've got one of those, you could do heaps of stuff with work and friction, looking at temperature rise when you skid along the floor, when you've just pulled a desk across the floor and things. All of it just showing that friction is causing work to generate a thermal energy in the surfaces that it's rubbing against. There's a FES application as well, but that's not practical. Um, if you're super uh, keen, you can, um, or if you have the right links to the right iwi, it would be awesome if you could get somebody to come along to show traditional ways of making fire. Uh, Māori had, well, I don't know if anyone still does it, because it's so, so such hard work, but they had these uh, special bits of wood and bits, yeah, two bits of wood that they, they could rub together and very skilled people could, could make a fire from that. There's a bunch of it um, on that link there. Um, we had to go with a drill onto a piece of wood this afternoon. The boys just got an old drill and a bit of pencil. They, could, they made quite a lot of smoke 
um, and enjoyed doing that. I was glad they didn't make a real fire. Um, so these are just some ideas here. Um, so we talked about the fire piston. That looks at work heating gases. So you do work and it goes into the, the thermal energy, goes into the gas, which then ignites cotton. Fun stuff to do. That's the energy conservation. And then electricity is the next thing that I've decided I'm going to do before we get to the full on thermal. So you can do the usual circuits measuring brightness. And this one's brighter than this one. And I, the, the link to the standard should really be through P equals VI. So the more V, the more I, the more power you've got. Um, and I would caution against getting involved with resistance and series and parallel too much. You can just look, what's the current going the whole circuit? Um, what's the voltage in the whole circuit and how bright it is? Uh, you can mess around with putting different bulbs in different ways, but you're looking at the output is the brightness, and that's a measure of your power that is converting into light energy. It's keeping it simple. Um, periods with VI, I happen to have a, an a MG uh, electric vehicle, and the dashboard of that shows the voltage and the current all the time, as well as the power as a percentage of power. So I have got as far as making a video with my daughter leaning over me, showing that you've got a voltage of all, well, when the, when the battery is steady, it's um, when there's no current, it's 400 volts. And as soon as you start running a current from, it gets a bit less. But uh, the currents can be 100 amps, which is proper numbers, I think. You know, it's, it's massive. So anyway, you can look at the numbers from an electric vehicle and talk about how much power they're delivering, which is obviously quite a lot to take a heavy car up a hill. Um, J car, I put this picture of the J car meter. So these are quite fun. Uh, so you can plug it in and get it to actually just tell you uh, how many watts is being used at any time or the total energy. And they have lots of different settings. I, I mean, most things when you buy them, it says, the wattage or the, the power that's going to be used when it's on for full. So your electric kettle is usually two kilowatts and it's two kilowatts. So measuring it isn't that much fun. But what can be really interesting is, is looking at the energy usage when everything's sort of gone to sleep. You know, is it worth turning it off at the plug? Will that, does that save energy compared with having everything on standby? Our whole school is left on standby when everyone goes home. Um, and I'm interested to know how much how much energy is being spent on that. Um, well, and in my house, I um, I'm, I was measuring the output of the, the modem and all the gubbins that I've got coming with the Wi-Fi router and all the things my computer's plugged into, even when my computer's asleep and the screen's not on, how much am I using? It's not very much, but it is, you know, I guess it all adds up. And same with the TV and the little box I've got for watching Netflix and things. All those things, how much are they using? We don't know. We just leave them on and they've just got a little red light, so there must be some energy being used. Anyway, measure that with the JCAR meter. Um, and of course, what you can also do is compare light bulbs. You can get, if you've got an old incandescent bulb, you've got maybe one of those compact fluorescent bulbs. You might have um, and different LED bulbs, get them all in a row, make similar brightness and look at how much energy each one's using. Uh, you can look at the numbers on the side, but you can also look at, um, uh, you can measure the current through it. We've got a natty device which somebody made, which is bespoke, which has got which we've got three bulbs in, and it measures the current that's going to you can turn them on and off on their own. But it's it's quite instructive looking at it, and it's a great way of leading into talking about efficiency as something you might be interested in. Because it's amazing how we use those old incandescent bulbs for so so long, and yet they're basically heaters. Anyhow, uh that was that. Um, could also investigate generators and batteries and solar cells as our power sources. 
So that's quite fun. Making batteries, putting, getting some little solar cells and seeing how much voltage they produce in different circumstances. And um, generators, I do recommend if you haven't got any of these hand crank generators to use those because they are so good for conservation of energy in so much as you turn the handle and it makes electricity, but then you feed it through to another one of those and it's a mo the other one becomes a motor. So you turn one handle and the other handle magically turns. And then you could do it the other way and turn, change the direction and fun stuff. Um, but just seeing that generators and motors are energy converters which one they, they're just converting the other way around one you put in you do work and get electrical energy and the other one you put in electrical energy and you can get it to do work and so that's uh yeah that's something i'm going to be doing thermal um so it's it's worth having a range of thermometer -y things as well as the liquid and glass um lots of people i've noticed have got thermocouples which came with their multimeters which have just been put in a box and nobody uses them so it's worth checking in your school to see if you've got some multimeters which will measure temperature because thermocouples are such a great way of doing it because they've got a much bigger temperature range and they can they're also really quick they're very small thermal mass so you can you can pick up a change in temperature that a liquid in glass thermometer would miss. And you can even put it in a Bunsen flame as well. Um, I've already mentioned the infrared thermometer um, and the thermochromic paper. Um, so for thermal, there's the classic demonstrations and sidepads actually, you know, they in the sidepad before the standard, they've basically locked in lots of um stuff from other books and they've explained induction convection radiation fine um so and you can sort of do your dropping pins investigation and you can look at uh, convection currents there are lots of really nice things you can do for convection looking at it in water so many ways to make it look really beautiful so um oh and there's always the uh, the spiral that you can make go around the tea bag rocket there's all these ones which think probably a lot of people use for the juniors. I never tire of sending a tea bag up into the air by setting it on fire. So the classic demos and touching things, conducts and insulators. I would just emphasize though, it's, this isn't junior science here and we should be oh, making them aware that there aren't just conductors and insulators. I mean, is brick a conductor? Or an insulator. Well, compare. You wouldn't want to use a brick to make a, a saucepan. It's a rubbish conductor. But on the other hand, if you're building a house, it's a pretty rubbish insulator. So, anyway, there is a spectrum. That's all I'm saying. So you can touch them and feel them and see what they feel like. Um, observing convection currents like the coal mine. Um, I found a Leslie Cube in our stock cupboard when I moved to New Plymouth Boys. Nobody knew what it was. Um, so if you have got one of those and you've never used one, it's just a, a cube of metal and you put hot water in the top. So put just put boiling water in. And then if you hold your hand against different sides, you can feel different amounts of infrared radiation coming off it. So the... Um, the shiniest silver side doesn't feel so hot as the matte black side. You can really feel the difference against when if you just put your hands close by coming out sideways. Crescendo still sell them. Oh, except they're not in stock. I checked yesterday. But you might just have one in the back of your cupboard. Um, but anyway, it's in there, it's in their list and they're not expensive. Um the, what I like to do for radiation is just to get thermometers and wrap them in. Um, matte black and in foil and just put them in sunlight and you can see the difference in how much they heat up. There's lots of experiments you can do there. The tricky bit is when you get into the uh, the numbers for these heat capacity and latent heat of vaporization. But I've made videos on this. So ask me if you want to know any more about the video. Um, but you just measure how much energy has gone into the oil or the water by you know the power and you know the time and you've 
done the previous stuff on electricity, so that all makes sense. Um, and then you look at the temperature rise. And the trick to getting good data is to not um, to, to not get much heat loss. So you don't want it to get very hot. You want short enough time that you can get a measurable temperature rise and a measurable time, but it's not, you know, if it starts going up to 70, 80 degrees, you'll be losing a lot of heat from your container, whether it's insulated or just um, a can. But a tin can and a bit of nichrome wire, and it works a treat. The latent heat of vaporization of water, just boil the kettle and let it just keep boiling, and you'll see the mass loss from it on, on scales. If you've got it on some little electronic scales, you can you can see the numbers going down even as it's boiling. So you can measure the mass that's lost in the time. You know the power of the kettle, you know how long the kettle's been on, so you can work out how much energy went in and how much mass was lost. So they're cool experiments to do. Definitely don't miss them out. Um, talked about the hand warmers. And, of course, another place of Masarangi Māori is the Hangi Stones. Um, if you want to just talk about thermal energy storage and how much energy is in them. Uh, and, of course, if somebody wants to come and make you a Hangi dinner and talk about uh, and have that as a bit of a project on the side, that would be awesome. Um, concrete buildings do the same sort of thing. They're a thermal energy store. Did I have anything else? No. Oh, yeah. Um, classic experiment. I know Dave was just talking about they'd done. So you let wax cool um, and you see when it's crystallizing the cooling rate uh, flat lines because heat energy, the, the sorry, get the words right, thermal energy is being released into the wax as the wax crystallizes. Um, and then they just go on and on looking at cooling different things, changing the color, changing what they're wrapped in, having stories about penguins being fluffy or not, or huddling together and building materials, um, traditional Maori building materials, modern insulation, the use of pink bats, but don't use pink bats because it's fiberglass. And the vacuum flask. I think you would be amazed at how many students are knocked out by the fact that you can have one vessel which keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. It stops heat going either way. Heat, you know, heat. We, we can't, the, the cold stuff is staying cold because heat isn't getting in. And the hot stuff's staying hot because heat's not going out. Same thing. Is that surprising? Maybe not to physics teachers, but it can be for kids. And that's my little brain dump of all the fun things that I could think of for doing, and I won't have time to do them all for sure. So I'm trying to pick the ones which are most engaging or most important. And, um, and like I say, I'm still writing the scheme as I go because we've written a scheme and they're finding that, oh, we haven't got this stuff. Definitely these guys, the latent heat ones are important. Um, definitely going to do the hand crank generators because that's like magic. Lots of these just little demonstrations. Um, definitely going to show them the video of my electric car and make them do some sums on it. That's not real practical. Uh, but we've got this, these bulbs we'll do, and they will want to make some circuits. So I'll, they're going to play around making some circuits, measuring voltage and current, and relating that to brightness. Carrie, we've got a question. Um, have you found a way of including solar panels or solar energy? Oh, yeah, I did. Well, I was on, that, uh, on that energy one, when I was talking about, oh, I hardly mentioned it, I went skip through it fast. So there are really three ways that, we uh, humans release electrical energy into the grid. Um, one is um, solar panels. One is with generators. Things turn it round, so it could be steam, but it could also be wind. So there's a generator, and then the other one is um, chemicals with batteries. But we don't don't use that for the grid because that's they're crazy expensive. But so we 
store electrical energy as a, in, as, as a chemical form. And then we can have it back later with rechargeable batteries. Mm -hmm. and we still make batteries, which are just one use uh, because of the chemicals. So, but there are those, um, so, so solar cells are obviously really significant and you can go, oh, that's a, that's a way of getting energy from, uh, well, electricity is just a way of delivering energy to us, isn't it? There you uh, go. But yeah. uh, we can harvest energy from the sun. Additionally to plants, we can use solar cells and they make electrical current, which we can yeah. then use. If you're, um, if yeah, you're lucky so, enough to be at a school with solar panels, and a few schools have them, I know Waiuku has them on top of their school. Oh, they if you've got them on the roof. streaming in every day. So it's uh, just a minefield. It's a it's treasure trove of information. If a you're very, very kind to... parent has just, mm. just dropped off a great big cardboard box full of little tiny solar panels mm. for us. And I've still got to work out even how to connect them. But I'm <laughs> sure this. Uh, there's lots and lots of things you could really get into with solar panels, but essentially, light shines on them, you get electrical energy, and then you can use that electrical energy to turn on a light. Yep. But what you're never going to be able to do is get that light to shine on the solar panel to turn it on. I had a case, he went, oh, Miss, why don't you do that? You get the light to come on and then shine the light on the panel, and then you're getting your energy. The perpetual uh, mess. Um, yes. Well, it's a good idea, but that's where inefficiency comes in, and yeah. you can't get your energy. But yeah, solar panels are worth a look. I don't think we could. I can't see how to spend a lot of time on them, really. Well, you could look at voltage and current that they produce. Just an example. Going back to your uh, thermal, we found a few um, in my school just for conversation starters, not mathematics. Um, uh, a a beaker of sand because most labs have sand just to put out some fire and a beaker of water same mass and mm -hmm. if you have temperature probes you basically put both beakers on the same hot plate and the kids are amazed at how fast the sand rises in temperature versus how fast the water or how slow so the even though there's no convection in the sand you don't stir exactly. it exactly or... you're just heating up sand um and the point is, is when you're talking about specific heat capacity, how can you apply that concept to different things? Because when you're doing it in year nine, if you teach year nine stuff like that, you rarely bring up specific heat capacity when you're touching the tiles while you feel cold or when you're standing on the carpet. But we were trying to come up with just non-mathematical conversation starters. And that was one. And I mentioned before we started, but I'll say it again, a beaker of 60 grams of water and 60 grams of cooking oil with a thermometer in each. Mm. And they just turn the hot plate on and they wait until the temperature rises to 80 degrees. We had to rewrite our experiment. Our first experiment was turn it on and leave it on for three minutes. And the, and the oil got, got up to 115 degrees. Ah. We're like, oh no! So... <laughs> Change the experiment. But the point being, it was non-mathematical. We didn't do anything with the math we got, the numbers we gathered, but we used it to introduce the idea of specific heat capacity that it's unique to the substance and it's about yeah. how much energy you need to change, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. Does anybody else have any um, either questions or nuggets to chip in? Yeah, any suggestions I can add to well, this? I'm going to maybe add on the... Uh sand whereas i've done it here um, um oops oh, i can't do it no i'll put it in a minute so um i've got the so i'll put your sand idea in i always thought it wasn't really fair because sand doesn't convect i know it's totally it's so, a different thing so it's, but not fair. The, it's just it's not the fair same experiment. area touching the hot plate so we said well let's just start the conversation yeah we used it to talk about the sea breezes um, in the night versus in the day on a calm day. That kind yeah, of yeah. So land heats up a lot more. Exactly. That does it some pretty hot places. Um, what's this? Uh, I'm just scanning the chat while we've been yakking. A sand in a tub and shake and measure. 
yeah, yeah. So you can do that with the lid on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, there's some links. Thank you. Um, yeah, and somebody mentioned that there's also oh. kits for wind turbines and there's stuff. There's so much out there. The trick is, as Carrie said, to give your kids a vast diversity of different ways energy can manifest, which is going to be never ending. So good luck. And as Carrie said, the hard part is choosing which activity to do. Because there and are um, yeah, and we need to try and tap it into where we want them to be to pass the exam. Mm. Uh, Matt has finished um, writing a dummy exam, which is going to go onto the NZIP site really soon, I believe. And um, a big recommendation, because Matt's doing energy bar charts next week, I believe. I think so, yes. And uh, just about everything while I'm teaching this stuff, I'm thinking, oh, so much, they understand it so much better if they do energy bar charts. So mm. today, with the rubbing the sandpaper, I was getting them to consider work done and the energy transferred and getting them to do an energy bar chart for what was going on. And um, so what goes on when you when you're rubbing the sandpaper, you're doing work. So this is low temperature and then suddenly it's got thermal energy. And then it hasn't got any thermal energy anymore. I thought hasn't got you know the thermal energy has dropped back down again. So where's that gone? Um so it's gone into the room. You've been heating the room. So first of all. You do work, sandpaper gets hot, then the sandpaper whacks the energy into the room. And they were able to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that's the important bit, I think, for the standard. And certainly we're hoping that the sort of questions that will be asked will be pitched at that sort of level with just a few tricky half MV squared things chucked in. Yeah. And, um, yeah, well, it's good because with that, that um, practice test, and NZIP will produce another one sort of mid year, mid to late year. Oh. Um, the, everybody that's playing this game will have at least two this year. So that's a good thing. Oh. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically showing them that, as somebody mentioned in the chat, it could be, you know, Coomer and Hot Rocks, you know? So there could be so many different connotations. It could be a motor lifting up something, and you're talking about the power of the motor lifting something up. I have no idea how you grow Kumara, Catherine. I don't know if you want to turn your mic on and tell me. So where do rocks come into Kumara growing? Um, I believe that they were used to store heat um, underneath the plants. So, and the way that they were grown, um, I don't know that much myself. But um, yeah. it was just an example. I know because I know that we have Kumara pits down here, which were used for storage. Um, but that's storing the Kumara. That's storage. But they were close to the places that they were grown, which were definitely um, north-facing and terraces. So um, I will talk to our iwi because we've got quite good links mm. down here in Blenheim. So, um, so yeah, around people, that. people have got uh, Indigenous knowledge that people are happy to share that's really interesting. Yeah, somebody yeah. just chipped in, uh, Mari just chipped in at the very bottom, uh, that Kumara seemed to need higher temperatures to grow. So you're making a heat sink with your rocks to get the temperature higher underneath the root system. That's my understanding from... Yeah, I'm just... Yeah. When, so do they have, I'd have, have to go up to Dargaville and know. have a chat with a few people and see. Yeah, so is it all... I mean, we grow Kumara in New Zealand now, though, don't we? Well, Dargaville is known for it, and yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try to surmise it, but um, the the experts in the field can tell you a lot. So that some people say they use charcoal for the same reason, but it's basically to to absorb some energy from the sun if you're trying to grow something in a climate that's a tad too cold. I guess looking at the of the chat, um, there is there's this potential confusion with students about energy sources uh -huh. and forms of energy yes and i remember being really confused about it myself for quite a while so you ask students about stores the forms of energy and where we want them to go kinetic potential and things like that and they go wind solar mm. wave power and tidal or whatever 
yeah, and they're mentioning these ways, ideas. places that we get um, ways ways that we can generate electrical energy from natural from natural resources like wind or burning oil or whatever it is we're getting them um this standard doesn't really it doesn't doesn't face that i mean no. it doesn't look at the energy crisis it doesn't look at global issues regarding energy doesn't even look at how much energy costs back in the day we used to work out you know your energy yeah. bill in kilowatt hours yeah. and how much energy have you used if you've been using your toaster for two hours a week and how much is that going to cost which is what None you brought up with None your power meter. Yeah. So we can put it in because it's sort of interesting. It's interesting to me. I'm not. Oh, is it interesting to the kids? Depends Some of it you. is. It depends on your kids, I guess. Um, but well, but, your, but your point it is, isn't the is, standard. Is, the standard is about en the the principle of conservation of energy and how yeah. energy, you know how it shifts around and we've got this mechanical and thermal and electrical and in some courses i do know that the um the physics and aerospace science first internal does overlap what you were just saying mm. and might be in the same course it depends on how schools have packaged their courses and how many assessments are in play and which assessments they've chosen they're so, important things to do and can be fun to, to make but they aren't addressing what you need to learn for the standard. Oh, totally. Not everything is assessed. No. Any other random nuggets out there, anything at all related to energy on this standard specifically? Does anybody have any questions at all? Aaron, oh, fire syringe is an, another name that it's called. That's it. That fire stick. Yeah, when I did the risk assess for it, because I thought I'd better do it. <laughs> It was called a fire syringe. Yes, we have one. It's quite persnickety to get used correctly. It's been hacked too many times. Um, Catherine does ask, does the standard include efficiency? Yes. Well, what's the system? They got me. We've sure. had a big discussion about efficiency and feel it absolutely should be in. The equations for efficiency are not in it, but... Uh, in the SLOs, when we were working on the, the, what the students should be able to learn about, we felt it was important that they could, that they appreciated numerically that efficiency is the useful energy out compared with the energy in, mm. or the useful power out compared with the power in, yeah. and that uh, examiners should be able to ask questions about efficiency based on that, although they would have to put the equation in, possibly, because it's not in a given um i mean it's for nzqa to decide their conditions of assessment of things but efficiency yeah. is important so Mark important mentions that, that uh the the answer that energy is the accounting system of nature so it's an interpretation of the slos the deficiencies are in play i looked at the old exam questions and it's overt that efficiency concepts were in play in last year's exam they just didn't do the calculation of efficiency. Mm. But it was it was hardwired into the questions and the information the kids were given. Well, they, um, and they looked to ask that question, you know, calculate the, how fast it'll be going, and then and now explain why it isn't going that fast. Exactly, and that's that's <laughs> efficiency. It's hardwired. I know, in. but it's just a frustrating question. Yes. You cal calculate this. Ah, oh, you got it wrong. Yeah. Um, Marty uh, Brathwick, um, you have a an example of Matanangamari example to share. Feel free. Turn the microphone on. Go for it. Uh, well, get my camera. Um, yeah, we um, yep. Uh, we came across a really interesting one through um, James Proctor at Massey University. He was it was actually a geology talk, but he talked about the fact that they um, you often find um, these artifacts which are basically hollowed out little bowls of uh, pumice and they, they form like if you put two halves together they form like a you know th th you've got a little sort of cavity in the middle of them if you put two halves together and apparently what they used to use those for was they used to put um, embers in there and then they'd wrap them and they'd carry the embers into the bush and obviously the pumice with all the air holes in it 
um, would insulate it and therefore um, it would keep the embers warm enough for them to be able to light a fire when they were out in the bush. So we ah. thought that was quite a cool one. And we, um, you can, I mean, it's, you obviously need masks and things to hollow it out because it's not nice stuff to hollow out. But if you can get a big piece of um, pumice from down the beach, you can sort of hollow it out with a drill, um, cut it in half, and obviously so you've got the two halves. Um, and if you get those uh, digital thermometers with the two probes, so they can then have a probe that's going in and they can measure what the temperature is on the inside and they can measure the temperature on the outside and see how they're different. So it's quite a nice little investigation. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Random other question was was put up. Uh, a resource sheet supplied for the external. To my understanding, it comes with all of the equations in the standard, um, whether you like the non-deltas or E's instead of Q's or whatever. But, um, and I would assume it comes with any specific and latent heats that are needed. But a resource sheet for the standard... I don't think last year's pilot schools had a separate resource sheet. It was all at the top of the test. Yeah. Somebody can clarify that if they know. But that's what I would predict. It's usually level two physics and level three physics that have separate resource sheets. If, if by one. resource sheet, you mean uh, a resource to accompany the exam. Yes. And what goes on in the exam. Yes. In level two and three, that would basically be a list of equations and constants. That's my understanding. I'm just looking back up. So who's asked about the resource sheet? Uh, almost down the bottom, second to bottom. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Shahrazad. Yeah. Yeah, so is, does that answer your question, Shahrazad? Mm. Yes. Oh, yes, you said yes. Cool. Okay. Anything else? I mean, we do not want to keep you. The evening is starting to wane, and I can't see the moon from where I am. It's it's a waxing gibbous, supposedly. Um, i not be up yet, I don't think. Yes. Soon. Yeah, for the old level one physics, you are correct, Lindsay. There used to be, but uh, they tried to collapse them down to just be at the tidal the title page, basically, which was annoying for kids to flip back and forth from the title page to the question they were working on. And you're totally correct. It's better to have a separate page. But NZQA make their decisions in interesting ways. Yeah, they might put something out with conditions of assessment later. Well, I've looked, and as far as I remember, they came out with the specifications for every external whether it's a quasi-internal, you know, those reports that are happening in term three, right. or whether it's an exam, like we're all familiar with. Um, they do have specifications out there for every subject across the grid. Um, there were a few that were coming out in February, but the rest were published way back in January, I think. I can't remember when I looked, but they're out. So you can you can pull them up and see what the exam or external specifications are. It's yet another place you do have to scan over. There's multiple locations of information. Yeah, looking at all these great ideas. I mean, you could spend a year on this stuff, but most oh, of us, yeah. You, yeah, I mean. But as you said, your school decided eight. to run with three standards. Yeah, yeah and, only three, and we still. Yeah, and still. half the schools that I surveyed a year ago that are sticking with level one were running with four standards, and the other half with three. And I was like, wow, that's going to be an inch. I'm going to resurvey schools later. Um, let's see what we got here. Um, not a much of a Mari context. Potential to kinetic. Dropping stuff. Yeah. 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 There are so many different examples. You're not going to be lost for examples. The trick no, is and, the, and the when it comes to is... thermal testing insulators and things like that. Yeah. Just. And... Uh, you, know, you just haven't got time. And you and don't as need you, to, As you, you said, Carrie, to. a lot of teachers, and I don't know in this meeting, but in general, a lot of teachers of year 11 kids may, might never have taught the thermal stuff. So that that's why a lot of conversations seem to be circling around that more than the dynamics or kinematics or motion or the electricity part of the stuff. 
But if you do have questions, we're, we're about ready to mop up here. I don't want to cancel everybody's thoughts. But if you do have questions, there are multiple venues to ask. Um, one's the Facebook group. The other is just basically email um, NZIP or email one of us, and we'll put you into contact with people that we can, if we can't answer you. Is anybody else teaching at this term as I am? Because no I'm I'm very happy to share the worksheets that I'm making. Um, mm. So if you want to contact me offline, if you want me to share the worksheets that I've been making, they're not perfect at all. They really have not been proofed adequately because I wrote it at lunchtime and then we did it period five. You know, it's like that. <laughs> but it's got energy bar charts in it. And uh, do, do, um, do listen to Matt next week. He'll explain it a lot better than me. Yeah. Gary, could you type your email into the chat so everybody can sure, see? Sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. And the the resources like Carrie is willing to offer will manifest inside that folder inside into the IP secure server. Um and in years to come, we'll have a very much more open place. But for right now, since so many people are yes. running to and fro, we thought we'd all keep them all in the same place. But yeah, there it is. So yeah, feel free to email me if you want stuff this term. Um, it won't, it will be what's and all, but I'm happy to let people have a look at what I'm writing at lunchtime to teach period five because it might be just what you needed. Yep. Cool. Any last minute thoughts before we call it quits? I think I might stop the recording so that people can say anything off off bar if they want. Oh, that question about energy graphs. Goodness. Okay, I'll keep recording then. What was the question? The question we just um, was um, energy bar charts seem to be talked about a lot, but they aren't mentioned in the standard. Is it recommended oh, yeah. to cover other energy graphs? Well, the, in the uh, these learning outcomes, we have recommended the use of uh, energy bar charts because we feel it's the simplest way of really going quantitatively into conservation of energy and looking at nature's accounting system um, and, and making it very clear for students what's going on. Um, the other energy graphs, I mean, and the FET simulation has um, pie charts mm. and the guy's going up and down the, uh, the half pipe and you can see that more energy is kinetic, more is potential and things as it's going up and down. They're hard to draw. And then there's uh, Sankey diagrams, which are really hard to draw and are just that bit more complicated. So whilst um, a student who's really understood the concept of conservation of energy and um, energy transfer processes would probably understand a Sankey diagram, they are a little bit more complicated, so we're quite keen to not um, to not have them too much at all. Yeah, really, you can do it all in energy bar charts. Yeah, any place I can like use a learn... diagram is with the light bulbs. The light bulb, a light bulb. You know, you can have a an incandescent, and the energy comes along, and it's just like heat. <laughs> A little bit of light and then you've yeah. got the led and you've got a small amount of energy and it's going nearly all of its light yeah and we're back to the efficiency argument but yeah but... so for teaching efficiency i can see that there's some point in doing it but we have not mentioned them in the slos and actually yeah. getting the kids to draw them is really hard because the, the... i see something i see it as if the energy bar charts are used in the teaching process the kids will be able to apply those skills to whatever might manifest in the assessment that's the power of the energy bar chart methodology and the teaching of it. Mm. If it's never overtly assessed, that's okay with me because the kids will be able to use that understanding to apply it to some situation they've never seen before, which, as we all know, is the game external exams play. Is somebody sits in a, in a dark room somewhere and thinks up some question that they don't think anybody else would have ever come across. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. 
We do have a question right at the end of this is mm -hmm. how will the exam or how long will the exam be is it one hour? The, the bare bones of every external in every subject across every year level is if it's an exam, it's designed to be done in one hour by the average kid in the country. And we all know the falseness of that when we get to level three in biology, but um, that is NZQA's premise for every external exam and every subject. That, but will they still have these big blocks? I mean, will you be able to do the two externals from PESS in two hours? So you're only doing one, you actually get two hours. They will still have a three hour block. Oh. The, the ministry, maybe it's NZQA, I can't remember, they get muddled in my mind. Basically, they're folding in the kids that get extra time into the same room. So the kids that get extra time will not have separate locations on your school's campus. They'll be in the same room with all the other kids. They just get to stay, and the other kids get booted out or leave whenever they... I don't think they even get booted out. They just leave when they want to leave. So the three-hour window is alive and well, and people misinterpreted that as a maths external was three hours. This is, well, the kid could stay three hours, but the average kid in the country would finish in less than an hour. So roughly, we're so we're saying that you should be able to do it in an hour. Yes, if they know the stuff; they can just do it. Obviously, exactly. some of them don't know the stuff and just leave as soon as they no. arrive. And you can sit there for three hours and put your head down and have a nap, and that won't help you. But to answer your question, Terry Ann, I hope that answers your question. That that's NZQA's premise across the board for all subjects. All right. Well, if anything else, I will stop recording. Okay. I'll stick around.